I, I wanted to talk about that whole, because all of this kind of builds up to where I wanted to go, which is our discussion about having that segmented, segregated mm. um, safe space for yeah. people of color at Saddleback, yeah. um, which I think is such, there's so much hay to be made out of that, that discussion. And someone asked me, like, Jason, well, why are you so concerned about it? You don't go to a purpose-driven church. You don't care about Rick Warren. You don't care about that. I said, the problem is other people still see him as the godfather, so to speak, of he might not be, you know, flashed on TBN and the 700 Club, but he still carries weight. And if he does something like this without anybody discussing it and call him on the carpet, trust me, somebody in Oklahoma is going to try it. Somebody in Vermont is thinking about it right now. Somebody in Florida is doing it as we speak. So I think it has to be addressed that this is not appropriate. That no, that, that's not the way we go about racial reconciliation or anything of that nature by saying we're gonna do racial reconciliation by segregating. How did we get here? What year are we in? And so I just saw him, I'm, actually I've heard another church that has done this already. So. But of course, Rick Warren, because of his name and who it is, brought that up to the forefront. And I really think that should be addressed mm. that this is not the way to go about what, what you might call racial reconciliation or what you call by healing or any of that nature by segregating another group of people. That, that's not, no, that's not going to work. But that was why I wanted to bring that up. Just saying. Yeah, I, I know we, we talked privately some and, and it really, really bothered you. And I, I actually thought it would bother you, um, although I didn't know quite the history you had specifically with Rick Warren. And I think that added to it. But I mean, obviously, um, as, as a black man yourself, this hits home. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, you obviously are someone who has good relationships with people uh, of different ethnicities. That. And uh, there might be a few, a, a, a few, there might be a few that I've lost since we started this conversation, but I'll try to get them yeah, back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I just mean though that you're obviously not racist. <laughs> and that's, I think this is the thing. And, and people did rightly point out in, in, in response that. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people are just confused about why Rick Warren is doing this, you know, what's going on in their church. But I think there's an assumption there. Yeah. The assumption is that there's a whole group of people that are offended. And, you know, I, 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 I know some people commented on the videos saying, yeah, there is a whole group of people offended and, and, I think some people think that they they have a right to be, but I, I you know I think a lot of people are voicing, and I think you are voicing that we can't just make the assumption that someone who has a certain background, ethnicity, skin color, whatever, should be offended in the present day because of you know, things that have happened previously in our history. And that's really the point of contention here. There are some people who think what happened in the past is behind us. We need to move on and move forward. And there are other people who are saying, no, we have to deal with that today. We have to continue to address it today. I, I got a couple of points about that. Do you have that? Do you have the article? I might be able to find it. <laughs> okay. Because there's a couple of key things in the um, in the press pass that with the invite rather that, that was sent out that kind of caused all the kerfuffle. There's a couple of key things in there I really think people should look at with an eye of scrutiny. You don't have to you don't have to be you know completely against it, but just look at it honestly and just ask some tougher questions. Like here we go. Yeah. And so let me just say something, um, you know, for the record, I, I personally don't, I don't really like this track that he's taking. I don't think that came out strongly in the video presentation I did, but that's because I was also commenting 
on this website here, which if you know me, and I know Jason, you kind of know me well enough now to, to know that I like for people to make sure that if they say something, they're very, very factual. Mm -hmm. Even if they're going to criticize someone, that's fine, but be 100% factual in the way that you go about criticizing. So my, my, my only concerns there were, I mean, look at this picture here, colored only, no whites allowed. That's not what Rick Warren was going for. No, it, it wasn't. Loosely here, he does say that it's for African-American black members of their church, as well as spouses, no matter your ethnicity. So I think it was, it was overstated to say that he was having a blacks only worship, no whites allowed. Correct. And for some reason or another, my phone was not behaving. I want to go, I want to just start at the top. Yes, go ahead. James 2, 6. And I'm going to use my study Bible, not my new one, because it's still under the Christmas tree. But I just want to point something out that I think one, this is a, this is a, ooh, I'm going to get in trouble for this. This is a, um, this is a, a Rick Warren-ism yeah. that is, is just pervasive. Using a scripture and not telling you what um, version it is or using several different versions of Bibles to find a point that you want to make. Now, I have no idea what James 2, 6 that he's using in order to say what he just said. Because in my Bible, it says as follows. Listen, beloved, I'm going to just read it in context. Listen, beloved brothers, has God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who he loves? But if you are, if you have dishonored the poor man, are you not, I'm sorry, are not the rich the ones that oppress you? So I'm trying to figure out where is this coming from this James 2, 6, because that doesn't say it. And the ones who drag you into court, are they not the ones that who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called. I don't know where you got that from. Because you said, if you say to a person, God be with you, I hope you stay warm and plenty to eat, where'd you get that from? That's not the proper verse. So that's my first problem, is they do this often. That's a... that's a. Yeah, that might, I don't know, that might even be the message Bible. I don't know. <laughs> they might be rocking with the, the, the passion. I don't know. All right, here we go. So this is a this. If you and I were members of Saddleback, this is what we would have gotten. Okay, because again, the article, the the um, the website. Actually, I'm not even going with that. I did think that the uh, the picture was a little clickbaity, mm. and but let's just, let's just roll with it. I'm gonna, if we went to the church, this is what we would have got. Tim would have got this. Jason would have got this. Dear Saddleback family. We don't want to be a church that just talks about love, that just studies love, that just defines love, and that just prays about love. It's not enough to just say we love people. We have to show it, show love. And no argument for me whatsoever. That's biblical. That's scriptural. Thumbs up for me. Head nod from Tim. Got you. I can't wait to share with you my vision for next year. All right. So we're talking about. You know, vision casting, I'm starting to get allergies, starting to get, oh, okay. And how we're going to continue loving and serving people who are in pain. So they've been doing this. When he says continuing, I'm assuming you've been doing it at least for the last year. Okay. And I think we'll probably, they'll probably say they've been doing it forever. All right. People who are in pain. But right now, before the year is over, we're starting with our black brothers and sisters. So now, I would think, okay, so they're going to focus on me, but are they ever going to focus on our Hispanic family? What about our Asian brothers and sisters? What about people who are um, Native American? What about are any of these people groups going to get this kind of love? Because he's setting himself up for revolt when you don't do this. <laughs> when he doesn't do something for the Pacific Islanders, 
in his in his congregation next year or the year after or doesn't put on the calendar, he's going to get a revolt because he did it for the black people. But let's keep going. So if you are an African-American and or black member of Saddleback and espouse no matter ethnicity, you are invited to a special Zoom gathering Monday and it's just passed um, with me, Pastor Anthony Miller and Anita Phillips, racial trauma expert and host of the Light Podcast. I didn't look up the Light Podcast, but racial trauma expert, that, that is making a humongous assert, ass, assumption about my relationship with Tim or my interactions with anybody else, racial trauma. Okay, that's, that's making a lot of assumptions. I'm already, I'm pumping the brakes a lot. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Our worship team has also arranged a one of a kind gospel experience. So you know, like I know, that means you're doing some music that you weren't doing before. <laughs> like, so you're gonna play some artists that you weren't, you weren't singing before. So that's, that sounds very patronizing to me. Okay. We want this to be a safe space. How has church not been safe before? Has your church not been safe? I feel like, and I go to a predominantly white church and they don't have any special gospel experiences and we have no trauma, racial trauma people on staff and I feel safe there. What are you doing at Saddleback that your people don't feel safe? Maybe you need to have a conversation about that. But I continue. They want a safe space for Black brothers and sisters to heal and be fed mentally, emotionally, and spiritually by their church. I'm going to stop right there. Stop. What have you been doing for the last however many years, if now, if on Monday, December 14th, they are going to, let me read again, they are going to heal and be fed mentally, emotionally, and spiritually by their church family heading into the new year. Oh, yeah, by the way, it's not your church family. It's only the black people and their spouses. Because if you don't identify as black, or because they said African-American black, so Pacific Islanders, Latinos, anybody else that wasn't black or whatnot can't be there. So I didn't get fed and nourished by my church family. You actually segregated us. There was no, there was no mixing of, of, of cultures. There's no mixing of people groups that better understand one another. Hey, I don't understand why you do this. Why do y'all sing like that? Why can't you clap on beat? Any of that stuff, nothing. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. For everyone else in our church family, because again, you just segregated a large population of your church out of there. I invite you to pray that God will use this night to begin, again, the healing process. What are y'all doing at Saddleback that now they're starting a healing process? Like, what are you doing? Healing process that leads to true fellowship. So y'all haven't had true fellowship forever. However long y'all been open, you've not had true fellowship. Somebody's going to clearly say, yes, they have had true fellowship. But the man just wrote right here that they didn't. It's Again, I'm, I know that I have a bias against Saddleback Purpose Driven Church of Rick Warren. I, I made no qualms about that. I want other people to read this and see how people can translate this without being biased, without being all up in a tizzy. This is not biblical church. Mm -hmm. This is not what Christ has called us to do. Now, it is, if there was, in fact, an issue at Saddleback, or maybe that directly impacted Saddleback, should they have something like this? Absolutely. And they should have everybody involved and everybody there. But again, as we said in a previous show about mental health and the value of preaching the gospel and the value of hearing the gospel, even for believers, this is a great opportunity for believers to know that whether you are a, a, a white man a Latino woman, a black man, um, a Pacific Islander, whomever, you need Christ. And your biggest issue is not the fact that me and Tim are throwing snowballs and fighting one another. Our biggest issue is that we are in enmity with God and we stand condemned. And all we're doing is we're sitting on death row waiting for the day to go stand before the judge and be condemned eternally. 
that's our biggest issue. Uh, me and Tim fighting is not our biggest issue. I, it, the whole church was fighting. If they were having <laughs> UFC fights every Sunday in church, it still wouldn't be their biggest problem. Their biggest problem is that they are in enmity with God. I'm going to finish this up. Healing process, the fellowship of our church, and that God will begin the ministry of reconciliation in all of us. So the fact that he used the word ministry of reconciliation shows me that you at least know that it's scriptural. The ministry of reconciliation is scriptural. But if we look at that scripture in context, we know that it means that Christ has re redeemed and, re and reconciled us to God. So therefore, now me and Tim can have the ministry of reconciliation. You're talking about having the ministry of reconciliation because you got a trauma, racial trauma lady there, and you're playing some gospel music. Please miss me with that. All right. Uh, racial reconciliation as we all head into new waters in the new year. What have y'all been doing for however long you've been open, Rick? What have you been doing? Uh, uh, this kind of stuff right here salts my grits because mm. when I realize that, when I realize, Jason, realized that I had been redeemed, that my condemnation had been wiped clean. And now I am in Christ and I will hear well done. Man, there's no way I can be mad at Tim. Tim could ran over my dog with his limousine. I don't care. Me and we're going to be okay. I have been redeemed. But you're not, you clearly have not told these people that. And I don't know, I don't think they're having race wars over at Saddleback. I don't think they're having full on Crips and Bloods types of situation, but on the same note, he makes it sound like they like I need a safe space. Why do I need a safe space in church? <laughs> what is unsafe about your church, man? I, I, I'm so disappointed in this. Um, and so this kind of stuff right here has to be called out because Folk will be thinking, oh, this is a great thing to do. Rick did it at his church. Just like when in 2020, when all this racial unrest kicked off, every, every church and their cousin was trying to do the pastor sitting on stage talking with three or four black people, the, the repentance tour. So they're going to be doing this too if they don't know that this is not correct. All right, that's the end of my soapbox. That's, that is, um, I think... Uh, well-articulated uh, expression of the feelings of a lot of people that uh, that saw this story. Uh, I think a lot of people are with you there, and I, you know, I, I'm glad you shared that and got that. I think you needed to from us talking. I think you needed to get that off your chest, right? <laughs> it, 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 again. Because you've been saying this to your plant behind you there the whole week, haven't you? You've been. I mean, you've... it was a little tiny plant when we started. You see what happened? Because <laughs> I've been ranting that much. My plant has grown. No, I'm just. I I really want people. And you don't have to believe me because I said it. Look at yourself. Look at yourself with a with a clear, critical thinking mindset. Like what, I mean, besides the fact that it's, it's um, social justice buzzwords left and right, do you honestly feel like that is what Christ called the church to do? And then a friend of mine always asked, did Jesus have to die for that, for this? You know, whatever it was that somebody preached or somebody shared. Could a, could a Muslim have done that? Could a Jew do this? Yeah, there, there, there's nothing about Christ, which is a stumbling block. So, I mean, truth be told, an atheist could do that. I mean, there's there's nothing that separates that what Saddleback did from the from you name them. There's nothing that made it unique. Now, could they have preached the gospel there? Yeah, probably could have. They probably could have. They could they could have preached a, a, a stellar gospel presentation and and they could have done that absolutely 
the track record is not strong in that in that category. And I've looked at it, I've read it, and I've been a victim of it. Mm. So I'm not just saying it out of hyperbole. I'm saying it because I know what I'm talking about. However, but let's just say that they did, in fact, preach a, a stellar sermon and, and, and really brought conviction. Why did you put that in your, in your passage? Why did you... Why do black people, why are black people the only ones that get a stellar sermon? Well, the white people, they don't get none? I mean, yeah, we're literally I, segregating. I think that's the bottom line is that there's a, there is a segregation that's taking place here. I guess the, the, the one thing that you said in there was that if there was an issue in their church, you could, you could understand why they would be doing this, but you don't think that's the case. I think what, what is happening, though, is that, and I know a lot of people are with you. I mean, they're, they don't like Rick Warren or they, you know, they, they have issues, and I get that. Um, but he is assuming the, uh, I, I think he's, he's really grabbing on to the assumptions, and which, which I would not be surprised if he certainly runs in some circles and maybe there's a lot of people in his church that are tied into this. But, you know, obviously what happened earlier this year with George Floyd was a real thing that sparked real protests and was a real, you know, national crisis point, if you will, on some level. And it, it did have to do with the black community. And Black Lives Matter has you know, it exploded in terms of its cultural attention and relevance beyond what it already was, which was, it was already growing. Right. So I think that's the backdrop. You know, he's trying to address it from that standpoint that now he's buying into it, obviously. And, and I think what I'm hearing from you is you have a very different perception of what's really happening even on a national level, uh, you know, in, in people's perception of, you know, how the black community sees itself as well as how it's being treated by the culture and the, the way to deal with that. And you have a different view than certainly what the mainstream culture is telling us, but, but what Rick Warren is, is assuming here and he's trying to address is the mainstream culture's narrative and perception of that issue. That's why he's focusing on the black community. And, and that's fine. The main, as I said before, does, what Christ needed to have died to have this, what you just have outlined, right? What Rick had outlined right there. I would say no. So why are you not giving them the gospel? Why are they not told that we're about to discuss this the, that sin is a real issue and it's sin that's separating us from one another, not anything else. It's our sinful nature. Now, are there some situations where somebody's perpetrating the sin onto somebody? Absolutely. But that doesn't absolve me from the fact that I'm a sinner. So I don't see, and I really, I'm going to go on a limb here and say that I'm pretty sure he didn't go counter to that, what we saw in this, in this article here or the, the flyer. So again, I understand what the, the media is telling us. The media is telling me I'm not supposed to be fool with Tim. Mm -hmm. Media is telling me I'm not, I mean, they're telling me a whole bunch of stuff. Miss me with that. Okay. However, in this regard, if the media is saying that, why, why do we need a church, which is supposed to be the embassy of the kingdom of God, people who have been called out of the world mm. into his own, why do we need you to tell us the exact same thing that the world is telling us? That's why they don't think that church is irrelevant because they say, you're not doing, you're not, you've made such an attempt to be like us mm. that if we shut down the concert hall, we can shut down the church too. If we shut down the, the gym and the pool hall, we can shut down the church too because y'all acting just like them. But then when people say, no, church is supposed to be essential, church is different, everybody's like, well, y'all been acting like us. You've been acting like, so again, I don't see that he was making, again, I was not on the call, 
somebody can get on it and feel free to share with us the call so that you and I can look at it and parse it ourselves. But without knowing that and just going by what I, I know and that article right there, there was no reason for me to believe that this was some gospel presentation and that hard hitting eternal issues were going to be addressed. And that's my biggest concern. Yeah, I mean, I don't know either. I, I tend to think that Rick Warren, first of all, theologically, he's, he's clearly in a different circle than, than you or I, you know, are. are. Um, but I know from, from what I know of Rick Warren and more of those circles that, you know, they, they would say that they are evangelistic and that they always try to utilize every opportunity to be evangelistic. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if he gave some sort of a, you know, presentation that had to do with salvation, even at an event like that, I wouldn't be super surprised. Or if he found a way to tie that into something that their church does evangelistically. Um, but you know, I want to I want to actually take a step back a little bit, or or just it, some thoughts came to my mind as you were talking, and it had to do with you know the the church should everybody keeps saying the church should operate as a unified body, but something that came to my mind is we don't see enough churches probably that display the unity that we should be displaying to the world. You know, when you think of how Jesus brought these disciples together and how they had some really <laughs> opposing backgrounds, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, we should see that reflected in the church. And I'm going to actually add to something that I didn't say before, but occurred to me that a lot of the black community sees the issues that Rick Warren's talking about mm -hmm. more in the way that he's talking about it. And it's, this is a challenge and I don't know the answer to this, but it's something we should all be praying about. If you're trying to build unity with people of other ethnicities, but generally that group of people sees things a certain way. And you know, what I'm getting at here is that there are churches that theologically are, you know, they, they, they're pretty biblical, I would say, in, in terms of their ministry. They try to be biblical. They believe the, the Bible. But they have some other beliefs based on kind of the makeup of their congregation. So if you think about how a lot of black churches – you know, the, the, the way that the people think politically where they are, they look at these issues more in the way that Rick Warren is talking about them. Rick Warren is from a more uh, theologically, I shouldn't say theologically, I should say politically conservative side of things. Okay. And, and, and I hope you, I think you understand what I'm saying here, that this is a real challenge that, I want the churches to be unified, but the the problem is we don't see it enough. We don't actually see churches that bring different types of people together, which is what you know we, we should be doing. And I think if if we if we did that, that would be part of the solution to the problem. Go ahead. I I, I agree with you. I just disagree on how it should be done. If the attempt is, um, I, I go to a predominantly white church. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's some black families there, but for the most part, you would look at it and say it's white. Um, if the attempt is, oh, we have got to get more people in this church that look a certain way, have we lost our focus on, I mean, I feel like they preach biblically. They they they're solid in their in their um, stances and their views. And I mean, there there are other nationalities besides white people that come. But for the most part, again, I think it's predominantly white. But 
if you take the eye off and say, oh, we've got to attract people who are of, of XYZ outward appearance. Are we one, violating partiality? Um, two, do we run the risk of saying, oh, if we play this kind of music, it will attract those people. And then we have to, then we run a, a foul in that regard. Mm -hmm. Or if we change up our service in order to attract this type of people. If we were doing this before, because this is what God called us to do in worshiping of him, and now we're doing something different in order to attract other people, who are we doing that for? Because if we were, if we could say that on January 1st, we were following God as, as strictly as we could, but on February 1st, we decided we need to attract more people of XYZ complexion or XYZ externals. So we have to change something that we were doing in January in order to attract those people. So now are we following God? I just think we well, were really... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't... I don't advocate for that either that that's not exactly what I'm getting at. Um, but I do think that to have the church reflect what theologically we are, which is a diverse group of people, mm -hmm. you have to do some things that aren't even along the lines of what you're talking about. You, you know, it's just, if I walked into a church having my background and, uh, and, and I just stepped foot into a church and they were in a different culture, for example, even if they spoke English, I would have to adapt to that. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm getting at is America <laughs> has a lot of churches mm -hmm. and a lot of these churches have cultural aspects to them. I I'll just put it out there. Let me, let me use John MacArthur because I've talked so much about him. What do you think most of the people who go to a church like Grace Community Church uh, think about things politically, for example? And, and how would they, you know, view America? Would, they wouldn't all be the same, but there would be probably generally speaking <laughs> a way of looking at things that's very different than maybe a... a, a another church in another part of the country that's, uh, you know, composed of mostly black people. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and and all I'm saying is that those cultural things really do affect the way we talk to each other and the way we look at things. And, you know, it's challenging. I, I find it frustrating because I don't, I'm not talking about changing the music or trying to, you know, attract certain people so that, you know, you, you have an affirmative action type thing going on there where you're trying to get certain numbers of people. But I am mm -hmm. saying that I would love, and by the way, I grew up on the outskirts of Trenton, New Jersey. I actually lived in Trenton for a time and the church that my dad planted was very much a multi-ethnic church. Mm -hmm. So I got to experience that. And I just, I think because of that experience, I know that it can be done, but it usually isn't. <laughs> well, and, and to me, because I've, I've had this discussion with many people um, on my side of the, of the discussion <laughs> and on your side of the discussion, Tim. And I mean, people go to church where they're comfortable. Yeah. It is not necessarily that you're making it uncomfortable. It's just, I don't feel comfortable. And people want to go to church, as we said before, that mental health discussion about church. If I feel more comfortable in a church that's predominantly black, then that's just what it is. There's, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. There's no other way to parse that out. Mm -hmm. um, so the same thing with Tim, if Tim feels more comfortable. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Mm -hmm. I don't think we need to start trying to make it an affirmative action campaign at church or any of that nature. If, um, you know, Presbyterians love their hymnals and we sing it and boy, I'm like, man, can we not sing this another, is there not a, a speed that we can sing this faster? Because also Presbyterians do not believe in skipping 
stanzas. So if there's six stanzas in the song, you're going to get all six. And if it's going to really slow, you will still be singing all six stanzas. And I'm like, man, you can't sing this faster? Well, you know what? No, they don't. <laughs> they're not, they're not going to change it. Not because I've made a complaint about it or otherwise. But I'm okay with that. Yeah. Because I feel like I, I feel comfortable with the songs are theologically solid. And I've had this discussion with my pastor and associate pastor that, hey, I feel good about the songs. Ah, you know what? I'm going to learn how to sing songs slow. But there's other people who they're not comfortable with that. And mm. that is okay. That doesn't make my church bad because they're not going to sing the songs faster. And it's not going to make that church better because they sing hip and jumpy around songs. No. If you like that, that's fine. If you feel that's where the, the order of worship that God has called for, knock yourself out. We feel that this is acceptable, and that's what we're going to do. And people go where they're comfortable. And I don't think – now, I always explain to my – um, my jumpy round friends, why we do church like we're doing. And a lot of them have appreciated like, oh, okay, I understand that now. Mm -hmm. now so I've had people come visit and like, okay, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was. I'm not going to come back, but guess what? I now understand why you all do church like you're doing um, and, and so forth. So I, I don't think that we should make it an either or. If, if that's where you're comfortable, that's where you're comfortable with. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Same mm -hmm. note, on the same note, just accept that other people, now that might mean that there's more of one particular people group that go to one, this particular kind of church. Mm -hmm. That don't mean that they're just, they're, they're blocking out black folk because there's all these white people there. You know what? Sometimes black folk don't like going to, going to these types of churches. It's okay. And on the same note, None of, I'm sure these people would not want to go to your church. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Stop worrying about who's not there, who is there, and hopefully Christ is there. And that's what I think should be the biggest concern. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is I think politics plays into a lot of people's comfort level a lot more than we verbalize or acknowledge. And Absolutely. I think politics... I mean, you know me, I'm very interested in politics, mm -hmm. but I think it's a, the church, I hear what you're saying and, and I don't disagree. Like I'm not saying we should come up with some artificial way around that. What I'm saying is if we really love Christ, it should spur us on to work through some of these differences we have politically because I just don't think politics should be dividing the body of Christ. Now, does that mean that we, you know, maybe it is going to change people politically to some degree as, as the, I get that. I mean, that might happen. I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't try to persuade people, but I'm just saying I'm observing and I'm seeing that what you just were talking about with Rick Warren set aside Rick Warren, because I know that that's a whole special thing, category, but what he's conveying there is exactly what a lot of people in the black community in America believe. You see what I'm saying? And I, I and, agree. I agree. Yeah. I think my only issue is the resolution can't be the solution, rather, to the problem can't be a secular solution. I'm with you there. And so, so whether or not, let's, you know what, let's go back. Let's say that church is, that Saddleback is a totally unsafe place. And they're trying to create a safe place for black people. The reason why it's unsafe is a sin problem. Okay, mm -hmm. so our solution can't be a secular problem. What, make the people, the, the white people pay 15% tithe and then give 5% to the black people? Like, you can't make a secular solution for a spiritual problem. And that mm -hmm. is all I'm saying. So 
whether or not it's real or not, the solution should be a spiritual solution. Again, I know somebody's going to put in the comments, you don't know because you weren't there. That's fine. And I admit I wasn't there. And unless yeah. somebody sends me a video of what was said or a transcript of what was said there, I won't know. So unless you know, neither yeah. of us did. So I think my my the conclusion I'm kind of coming to here is that I really agree with you. Like, again, I, I said this earlier, I, I don't think Rick Warren's approach was was really the best one. But he's trying, and here's all I'm saying. Even though I I, I don't necessarily like his approach, because I agree with you. I think there's there's just a lot of buy-in to cultural things and things that are problematic, even from a biblical standpoint. But what I do think is that there are a lot of churches that aren't making any effort to try to deal with the reality that we are divided. I'm talking about the body of Christ is divided in ways that it shouldn't be because of our culture. Now, I think what Rick Warren's doing probably adds to that, you know, but, but a lot of other churches add to it in their own way. And that's all I'm saying. It's like, I, I think we have got to, we've, we've got to work at it. And, and I know what you're, what you were saying earlier, like, I'm not talking about trying to have a certain amount of people in your church of a certain color or anything like that. I'm not even talking about that, but I'm talking about the reality that when you hear Rick Warren use those terms, there are a lot of people who are even in churches who would say, yeah, he's right. And the, the only way to deal with that is, is to engage people and have good conversations with them on, you know, the, the assumption that we, if we are in the body of Christ, we have got to talk about some things. And that's, and I have no argument with that at all. Just two things. Okay. The broad brushing of all people. Yeah. I feel like is a, is a, is a non-starter. So I think if, if, if in fact, the, the black population at Saddleback Church really felt that way, then maybe there needs to be some, the elders, the deacons, the leaders need to have some one-on-ones and really parse that out it, on a, but the broad brush, or brush that every black person is having this problem, I feel like is a bad look. And mm. then, is, is, to me, I don't think that's, a, that's fair because there are people there who are not, I, I'm almost, I'm willing to guarantee you there's somebody sure. at Saddleback in Orange yeah. County that yeah. did not feel like that, that message spoke to them right. in their situation. But then two, my second point is make sure that the gospel is the solution. Now, I'm, I know somebody's going to say, well, you're only trying to spiritualize it and so on and so forth. Yeah, because at the end of the day, the only way we're going to have true reconciliation is to recognize that we were once unreconciled to God. While we were his enemies, Christ died for us. So in that regard, we weren't his friends. We were his enemies. Mm -hmm. And therefore, he still died for us. So we are now able to fix problems and have dialogues and tough conversations and so forth. But the end result is because is the end result is bringing them closer to the gospel because they're my brothers and sisters in Christ, not just so I can feel superior and you can feel worse because something that your ancestors may have done to some of my people, that's not fair. And and, so, and that's what I'm saying. That is the challenge. That is the body of Christ. Theoretically, <laughs> I feel like. A lot of us on various sides of issues politically would say we should be unified. But in practice, it's like having a, a family member. You know that they're part of your family. Mm -hmm. 
But if they do something that you just, you don't see eye to eye, <laughs> it, it can be tough to work through. That's where the rubber meets the road. I mean, marriage does that, right? You, you, you have things that you got to, and that's all I'm saying is um, I, I just feel like we're, we're lacking that. And I don't really, I don't have any point of disagreement with you. I think th these actually us thinking it through like this is really helpful. My admonition though is for some people, and I guess since you got in trouble multiple times, I can get in trouble. I think some people are so quick to say, I don't like, you know, this or that or the other thing. And they're really, you know, but they don't necessarily see like, where in my life am I willing to talk to someone who it is not easy to talk to that person about this issue, mm -hmm. but I'm going to do it <laughs> because I really, really love them. And what we do is we write each other off so quickly. Yeah. And, um, and I see that happen in our culture. And all I'm saying is I think politics has really uh, encouraged us to do that, to write each other off. And I think it happens within the body of Christ. And it's tough. I see this happening right now. I see, you know, and some would say you have to have these divisions. Um, they would say, well, let's take the critical race theory thing right? Okay. If, if, a, if a church does anything that even looks like critical race theory or, or looks like it's accepting at all of, I'm um, trying to think of the word, but you know, some of those, those ideas, um, I, I know, cause I've, I've read what people are saying. I know what people are saying that's, that is a hot button issue, right? I okay. mean, that is, and I get it. It is. But if you know a brother or sister in Christ who to some degree has bought into that, what do you do with that? Some would say they're not really a Christian because <laughs> they've started to buy into that. And I just say, wait a second, persuade them, you know, love them as a brother or sister and talk to them about it. And, and that's what I feel like is happening right now with a lot of these cultural issues. How about this one? This is Jude uh, 121. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And this is what I think is kind of pointing to. If you have somebody who's caught up in one of these things and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. Do others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh? So, I mean, I, I, I have no problem having a conversation with anybody who's delving into the nuances of critical race theory. I disagree with it. Yep, I just said that. Um, I disagree with it, and I'm not going to, uh, I mean, I'm... I'd be happy to have that conversation with anyone who wants to have true dialogue and understand why I disagree with it and why I think it's, it's against the gospel. It goes against biblical theology. So if you are doubting in theology and you accidentally start tiptoeing into this area, I wouldn't mind if you're willing to hear and discuss and unpack it, I'm fine with that. But if you just feel like, oh no, you know, all black people need to leave white churches, then you know what? There's, there's nothing I can do for you. Um, Cause that's not, that's not biblical. I'm sorry. So, mm. I'm going to get, I'm, yeah. I'm staying in trouble this week, man. Keeping me in trouble. <laughs> Last two weeks, yeah. man, in the world. And, and, and yeah, th these are good things. And I'm really glad that you, uh, that you wanted to, to, to talk about this. Um, I, I feel like this is stuff we need to keep talking about, actually. Um, and, you know, I'm sure different specific circumstances or, or um, you know, different th 
things that are current events will probably bring the conversation up because it's I'm just, sure. it's a constant thing. But, you know, there, there's just, I know from my own experience and you probably do too, that, you know, there are definitely people I know in my life, they've, they've just been brought up very differently. They see things very differently, even politically. And I, uh, I, I just, I just want to actually do something that I think some people are doing, but a lot of people aren't, you know, and a lot of people, they don't even know how to have any kind of a conversation with someone. They don't, they just don't know how to do it. Cause they're just, they just get so riled up and upset, you know, <laughs> and that they just don't know how to talk to someone who looks at things differently. And again, I, I don't think discuss things. I grew up in a family. I may have told you, I grew up with my dad and my two older brothers and we still sometimes argue like we talk very, very persuasively, you know, like that, but that's love. <laughs> you know, that's like, man, I, I love them. And I love to argue about things because they're important things. And uh, some people, they just can't do that because they just cross that line of if I'm arguing this with this person, now I'm mad at them. And I, and then they just, I don't know they write people off <laughs> and they, and they kind of hate certain people. Right. And I guess one thing I'm frustrated by is sometimes the way things are framed, there's, there's never even the start of a conversation mm -hmm. because if someone heard about me secondhand and they heard enough bad things, they wouldn't even be able to talk to me right. because they've, they've heard so many bad things. They, they, they just, they'd already have so many ideas of who I am already, you know? So I just want to make sure that uh, we, we, we really, as the body of Christ can talk about things, argue, and by all means, even if that means we are going to get really heated and say, this is right. And this is true. I'm all for that. Right. Right. I'm not for compromise, but I am for sincere, true, deep and honest dialogue.